Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for joining my presentation today. Um, I'm here presenting on Widgeable Land, um, and that's based in Lismore. So I'd just like to um, acknowledge them. And now moving to my presentation. So I'm Nicholas Syrak. I'm a PhD candidate at the Lismore campus, and I'm studying engineering. And my talk today is on hybrid multiple tube concrete columns incorporating advanced composite materials. So traditional construction materials. So you've probably seen most structures around uh, are built with concrete. So concrete's extremely strong, particularly in compression. So that's like crushing forces. And uh, it's very readily available. Um, it uses uh, common materials like sand and water. And uh, it's, it's very cheap. So that's why you see it used everywhere. Um, particularly in larger structures. So, so in larger structures like bridges, uh, tall, tall buildings, big industrial warehouses, they're typically constructed with concrete. Um, and also uh, steel structures are very common as well. So we often use these materials in conjunction with each other, but um, quite often steel structures are used um, solely by themselves, typically for sort of smaller structures like uh, sheds and warehouses. Um, so concrete's very strong in crushing and compression, whereas steel is also strong in compression, but it's also very strong in tension, which is like pulling forces. So um, that's why we use them in conjunction because the concrete's strong in compression, tension strong in, um, and steel's strong in tension. So research motivation. So two main uh, sort of reasons why my research has evolved is the first one is the deterioration of traditional RC structures. So concrete, uh, has typically has steel rebar within it and when it's used in coastal and marine areas uh, once the the concrete cover has any sort of cracks in it uh, the steel becomes exposed to the the salt water and sort of the moist air and then the steel starts to corrode and that's when you start to see deterioration which you know as a result results in loss of structural integrity so this is sort of one way how structures start to fail is through corrosion of steel the other is the poor seismic performance of RC structures. So seismic performance is like earthquake performance. So often you'll hear on the news, you know, when there's a big earthquake, some buildings might fall down and that's typically uh, concrete structures. So while concrete's super strong, uh, it's a very brittle material. So it cracks really easily. And when there's any sort of movements in the ground, the structure cracks easily and, you know, it comes essentially crumbling down. So they're the sort of two negatives with traditional structures. So how we how we've started to use to bridge this gap is FRP composites. So they're actually fiber reinforced polymer composites. So you might have heard of some common ones, uh, carbon fiber. Um, you know it's used in uh, you know automotive industry. So used in like cars and Formula One. It's also used in aircrafts as well. Fiberglass or glass fiber. Um, it's used typically in marine areas like boats because it's quite a cheap material. So it's used in like boat construction and also aramid. If you've maybe heard of Kevlar. They use it in like bulletproof vests and things like that because it's got great energy absorption capacity. So the benefits of this material is that it's corrosion resistant. So um, it's not going to corrode in salt environments, in wet environments and things like that. Um, it's extremely lightweight as well. So com in comparison to say something like steel, it's to get the same strength benefit, it's probably something like 50 times lighter. So it's very lightweight. Um, it's also as strong or stronger than steel in tension. So in pulling forces. Um, and as a result of those two, it's got a very high strength to weight ratio, which makes it great in use for like airplanes and things like that. And you're able to make complex shapes out of it. So similar to steel, you can pretty much form any shape you want out of this material. So how we use it in concrete construction is through this technique that's been around for about 20 years. It's called confinement of concrete. So how that works is when you crush a concrete column, so you crush it in compression, once the concrete cracks, it just wants to expand outwards, it wants to laterally expand. So what we essentially do is we wrap it with this FRP material so that as the concrete starts to crush, it, it doesn't allow for any lateral movement. It essentially holds it in position. And as a result of doing that, it improves the strength of the column. It improves its ductility, so how much it can compress. And it also gives it that corrosion resistant skin. So by wrapping the column with this material, um, it actually makes it corrosion resistant as well. So what they've been doing recently in the last sort of 10 or so years is uh, using it for rehabilitation work. So when there's a, a poor performing column or a rusting column, uh, they essentially brush it with epoxy and wrap it with this FRP material. And that makes it corrosion resistant and it proves its strength and ductility. They also do this for under-designed columns. So in areas where there's um, earthquake zones, 
and they've under designed columns, they can uh, wrap them with this material to make them stronger and more ductile. But where I'm looking at is I want to use it in new construction. So in the last sort of five or so years, there's been a push to, to utilize this material in new construction due to all of its benefits. So some benefits is that if we use it in new construction, so in like a column, it gives it a corrosion resistant skin straight away. It also works as a stay in place formwork. So instead of having to build timber formwork and pour concrete in it, we can just directly use this tube as formwork. So it saves all the labor costs there. And, and again, it gives us that confining device to improve strength and ductility. So on the, on the left here, we've got this graph. So it's essentially a force on the vertical axis and then displacement or compression, amount of compression on the X axis. So we've got two curves. The first one or the bottom one is our just typical concrete column that you see everywhere. So as you can see, um, as the, the force and the duct, the force and the displacement increase, it gets to a peak where the concrete crushes and then it starts to lose all its strength. And now if we compare the exact same column that's wrapped with FRP, the initial portion is quite similar. And then it has a bit of this curved section where the FRP begins to activate because the concrete starts expanding outwards. And then it starts to go linear again. And that's once the FRP has fully become active and then the FRP just holds that concrete in place until it gets to a final point where the FRP just explodes and ruptures. So as you can see, vertically, it gets much more force and horizontally, it gets much more displacement. So that's kind of the benefit of this technique. This technique's actually well established now. So it's in many design guidelines throughout the world, you know, in Australia, US, China, everywhere. This is it's a very well established method for strengthening concrete. So what has come about in more recent years is trying to use this in new construction. So on the left here, we've got some examples of some attempts to uh, optimize this. So we have the green outside tube, which is that FRP tube. Um, the hatch is concrete and then the black is steel. So they've looked at some different ways to incorporate steel into these uh, columns. And this is what they've come up with so far. What I'm proposing in my research is actually a, a similar to this, but it's a proposed hybrid multiple tube concrete column. So I'm going to refer to it as an MTCC from now on in. So <clears throat> as we can see, we've got our internal steel tubes um, and we've got all the rest of the area filled with concrete and then we've got an FRP tube on the outside. So how this essentially works is down in the bottom right, as we're crushing that column, so that's a cross section. So as we're crushing it, the concrete inside the steel tubes wants to expand outwards. But there's also concrete uh, on both sides of that steel tube. So the concrete is actually wanting to expand outwards there as well. So it's essentially preventing that steel tube from buckling inwards or outwards because there's concrete inside it and outside it. So it's preventing any buckling of the steel. And then ultimately everything wants to expand outwards, but the FRP tube itself holds everything in together. So it's just a huge <clears throat> confinement effect. So everything's holding itself in and everything's preventing it from buckling. So that's kind of how the concept of it works. So the idea is that it's going to effectively confine concrete. It's going to fully exploit the yield stress of the steel because it's not going to allow it to buckle. And it's, it uses small scale commercially available steel tubes. So these are widely available off the shelf products. So they can easily be used in industry. So I developed a test program. <clears throat> the objective is to understand the behavior of these columns with a range of different test parameters. So the column height I have is 600 mil and the diameter is 200. So it's pretty much a three to one ratio height to diameter. So I've looked at the following column configurations. So the top two are our multi-tube columns and then we've got some comparison columns below just to compare how they behave. We're looking at two different types of FRP. So we're looking at fiberglass, which is the most commonly available and also basalt, which is a, a new uh, FRP composite that's uh, a bit more sustainable. And the internal tube types are steel and aluminium. So I'm using those as the internal tubes and I'm looking at normal and high strength concrete. So to prepare my samples, it was quite a long process. Um, I got prefabricated FRP tubes so I can get them pre-made. Pre and then what I've done is I've had to cut them to the length of my column. I've also bought a uh, commercially available steel tube and aluminium tube. And then I've cut them to the length, which is also 600 millimeters. I've then got the tubes into the column arrangement. I've just had to spot weld them on the ends. 
So the reason I've had to spot weld them is that when you pour the concrete, you don't want the tubes flying around everywhere. You want them to be held nicely in position. So you just uh, spot or tack weld the top and the bottom of each. And then for those six column ones, we can simply just pull the middle one out. Um, so it's a nice efficient column form because uh, using seven tubes like that always results in uh, that cross section. And then we just grind the, grind the welds at the end to flatten the weld spots. Next, we have to build some form work. So for casting these columns, uh, in practice, we, we wouldn't have to do that. We just directly uh, you know, place the column in position and pour into it. But for a small scale test like this, we need to build some form work. Then we align our samples in the form work, as you can see on the left there. And there comes a concrete truck and we pretty much dump all the concrete on the ground. Uh, and then the laborious process of physically putting the concrete into each one of these. Um, and then, 10 minutes, Nick. Yeah, thank you. And then vibrating it all. Uh, and then we allow about a month for it to cure. So once it's cured, we grind the tops off. So we get a nice smooth surface. Uh, and then we cap the ends with gypsum cement. So that pretty much just gives us perfectly parallel surfaces. So to test it up, we just test it under straight compression. So it's just direct crushing, just at a constant rate. So at a constant displacement rate, we just keep crushing it until it explodes. Um, we've got four lateral strain gauges, so we want to measure the outwards expansion uh, and then we've also got some LVDTs which measure displacement axially. So we want to compare the outwards expansion to the downwards expansion and that's how we can build our models and design our engineering equations to predict the behaviour. So just looking at failure modes, um, it's quite similar to those columns without tubes inside it. So the failure pretty much results from rupturing of that FRP material as you can see in those photos there. So we've got glass on the left and basalt on the right. Um, one thing interesting to note as well is I did some hollow tube tests. So just tests on the hollow tubes without concrete. Then I also did some tests of the tubes with concrete in them. And as you can see, when they fail, um, it's always due to buckling of the steel tube. But as I mentioned before, the way we've set up the column is that there's concrete surrounding all of these tubes. So when we opened up the column after testing, the actual MTCC column, we can see that the actual column hasn't buckled at all, these steel tubes. So we've effectively, effectively restrained buckling in the internal tubes, and that's uh, resulted in full utilization of the steel. So we've prevented buckling on those internal tubes. So now we're gonna look at the actual behavior of the column, and we're gonna compare it to the sum of its individual components. So we're gonna look at the behavior of the column, then we're gonna look at the behavior of uh, an FRP tube with just concrete, and then we're going to add the effect of, uh, say, six hollow tubes. So in these graphs here on, on, the, on the left and the, the right down the bottom, um, the blue is essentially the sum of the two components, which you can see at the top, and the green is essentially the behaviour of the actual column itself. So as we can see in both comparisons with steel and aluminium, um, the, the, the actual confinement effect has actually, actually uh, resulted in increased load carrying capacity on the y-axis and increased ductility on the x-axis. So it shows that uh, by actually putting these materials in an optimised arrangement, we can actually improve the strength and ductility of the column. So we've also looked at what's the influence of the internal tube. So we've looked at, okay, we've got steel and aluminium tubes. So with steel, we've got red, aluminium, black. Um, and steel's, as we know, much stronger than aluminium. So we would expect the steel columns to be much stronger. So on the red ones, we can see that it's far stronger than the aluminium, whereas the green is without tubes at all. So we can see that even adding uh, aluminium, we're improving the strength and ductility of the column already. And by adding steel, we're significantly improving it. What I've also done is I've normalized it. So I've actually subtracted the, I've actually subtracted the influence of the internal tubes itself. So I just wanna see what's the confinement effect on it. So how's, how's the concrete behaving better or worse? So as we can see on this right graph, we've subtracted the tubes and now we can still see that the steel is significantly behaving better than the aluminium and the no tube column. So we can still see that that confinement effect is evident once we've already subtracted out the behavior of those tubes. And since we're testing glass and basalt, I compared both materials as well. And as you can see, they behave along these three graphs along the bottom, uh, they almost behave the same. So regardless of that, uh, type of material on the outside of the tube, they still behave uh, very well. 
And I've also looked at the influence of FRP thickness. So I had 1.5 millimeter thick tubes and three millimeter thick tubes. And we can see uh, with the black ones, they're three millimeter thick and the red, the red curves are 1.5 millimeter thick. So we can see that there's, by increasing the thickness of that tube, we can significantly increase the strength and ductility of the column. So one sort of benefit of that is that if we do need to design our columns, uh, you know, stronger and more ductile, we can simply uh, play with our parameters. We can play with our internal tube materials. We can play with how thick our FRP tube is, and we can really sort of exploit how we want our column to behave. So in conclusion, uh, results show that these MTCCs effectively restrain buckling of the internal tubes. Um, they behave better than the sum of their individual components, as we saw. Stronger internal tubes, the so steel in comparison to aluminium, show stronger MTCCs. So as the internal tube material strengthens, the behaviour of the MTCC gets better. And increasing the thickness of the FRP tube also greatly increases both the strength and ductility of the column. So thanks for listening to my presentation. I'm happy to answer some questions. That was perfectly timed, Nick. It was bang on. 15. Thank you, Nick. Excellent job. That's that my was first really trial run. <laughs> oh, good work. I had no idea on timing, so yeah, it was good. Perfect. Awesome. Well done. Now we might get everybody to turn their microphones on and their videos on, and we might uh, ask Nick some questions. Does anybody have a question to throw at Nick to start off with? Not necessarily a question, but um, as always, it's just so fascinating and you can see this being so valuable for construction. It's amazing work, but mm. who, did, who did you recruit to help you do all your form work? And I can see a team of uh, people there. Who are they? Are they um, other students or friends at least? Yeah, so you can or? see sort of on that second image on the left, um, side question. Mm. So, um, Two of those are PhD students as well. So one of them is actually Albert, who's presenting next. So he's been a big help as well. Um, and then also, obviously, the technical staff help out as well. Um, but yeah, like yeah. Ju just to construct these columns took about you know three to six months of my time. So it's it's a long process because yeah, a lot of tests. Yeah. So it's, yes, it's a lot of did you, a lot of tests. Did, did you did you already have the welding skills and that under your belt? No, um, <laughs> it was not, not good at all. Um, you know, basic drilling was okay, but yeah, all that other stuff like welding and that, I, it was all new to me. So yeah, it could have been more efficient if I was, you know, a tradie, but no. <laughs> I have a question. What yeah. made you interested in this project to begin with? Like what sparked your interest? <sighs> so I've always been interested in, structural engineering so i've always been interested in you know concrete and steel design but this project itself actually came about because uh two of my supervisors actually won an arc grant to, to study this in particular so um i guess the concept itself wasn't wasn't my my idea um i, I sort of joined an arc project to do this so yeah it's been a good project though it's really interesting thing to study but yeah that's sort of where the idea came from and how fast through are you um i'm almost at three years but i've probably still got another six months to a year because i still got a i'm just working on modeling now so don't worry i'm in the same position <laughs> almost done not even close to being done <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> excellent and what can you see um with this project after your phd is finished do you want to continue on with something like this or? Yeah, like, look, I'd love to, if, if there's the opportunity, I'd love to continue it. But in saying that work like this is, it's very expensive. Like just, just the columns itself was just, to, just in this study I've shown is probably, you know, probably 20 to $30,000 worth of columns. So it's like, wow. it's a really expensive project. So um, it really just depends on if there's funding for it and all that sort of stuff. Like I'd love to continue it. There's, there's lots more to do on it, but um, that's sort of the deciding factor, I guess. It's very expensive work. 
Great. Marion, do you have a question? No, I was just sympathising with the very expensive work. <laughs> <That's Yeah>. Mine too. <laughs> yeah, so. Oh, actually, I was going to ask, are you having to apply for any grants or bursaries to sort of assist in that funding or is your ARC, your supervisor's ARC kind of covering all that? Yeah, so for all of this, the ARC and, you know, assistance with student budget and things like that has pretty much covered it. Um, but yeah, if I wanted to do any sort of further work after this, I, I feel like I'd probably need to secure some sort of grant or have somebody secure a grant for me and work under them. So that's sort of the only way to sort of run these projects. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yep. Albert, do you have something to add? Considering you're involved. Uh, not really. <laughs> Because I kind of like understand what he's doing. <laughs> what sort of involvement did you have? What was your role? Uh, most of the time was the fabrication process, concrete casting and testing. Yeah, and sometimes we discuss together. Yeah, I reckon. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, like mm -hmm. some things are just, you know, you need two people to do it. It's... It's, yeah. yeah, you just can't do it by yourself, something. So it's been very good having supportive people around me, which is great. But I think he did most of his works on his own, except the casting. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Any more questions from anyone else on the floor? I actually have a question. Um, Nick has compared the glass and carbon, I reckon, and basalt yeah. and aramite. Um, which one you reckon is the best for, for example, um, to be the column? Which so one you reckon? This is pretty much glass and basalt. So mm -hmm. since their mechanical properties are quite similar, there's not really much difference in their behavior. Yep. Um, if you were to use something like carbon, um, the force would be much higher because carbon's stronger than these materials. But in saying that, um, there's a cost to pay going with carbon. Carbon's about 10 times the cost of these because these are a bit more sustainable materials. So they're easier to come by. So it, it's just going to be a balance of, you know, strength versus cost. So you can go with a stronger FRP material like carbon, but it's going to cost a lot more. So yeah. it's probably more efficient to just use a, a glass tube that's thicker because that's yeah. still going to be cheaper than using something like carbon. Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah, I think I'm good. Thank you, Albert. Anyone else have any questions for Nick? No? If not, there's going to be a morning tea.